Mahindra and Mahindra, the stock is on a bounce back after the press conference and after the analyst call where brokerage is saying, okay, Mahindra and Mahindra is expanding, but right now let's focus on the core business, which is firing full cylinders. And that's what we plan to do. Ajesh Chirujkar, Executive Director and CEO with Mahindra and Mahindra joins us now. Good morning, so nice to have you on ET now. Thank you for joining hi, us. Hi, Nikunja, and in our studio. studios, thank you for being here. Pleasure. They're like boom time for SUV. It is indeed. And will the boom time continue for next three years, if I have to ask for that as a big picture scenario? As a, I think SUV as a percentage of uh, passenger vehicles. Firstly, it's more than 50% It's now. crossed 50 now. Yeah, it's crossed 50. Last count was 40. For the last year, it's, I think the last quarter has crossed 55. Wow. Uh, so, and that's, a, that's something which is prevalent around the world. So, it's not like it was totally unexpected. Mm. Of course, in India, we have to understand that there are many SUVs which are actually crossover platforms, yeah. and that's enabling, uh, you know, the market size to get bigger because they're able to come in at lower price points. Uh, so we are actually in a good place because uh, we've been an SUV company all along, and uh, we think this is a trend which will continue because uh, the many things about SUV in an India kind of context, SUV represents much better status, ground clearance, you know, sitting high. These are all very important for Indian customer space because of joint families or, you know, having visiting families. So, several en enabling factors, fortunately, for us. There are 40 SUV brands now, this is what I've been told. Yeah. Everybody wants to have a piece or a pie of the SUV market. Yeah. That's a growing market. Yeah. When there are 40 brands which represent one category, yeah. don't you think somewhere the pricing power will come back to the consumer in that case? Uh, so, I'm going to answer this question in two parts. Nikun. One is, uh, you know, when when you have multiple brands, it helps categories grow. So, and that's what we, we're seeing happen. Uh, in this crowded market, we've taken a very conscious call over the last three years in particular on the kind of SUVs we want to make. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in uh, when you think about it, you may say that, you know, if you're going to have a strategy which is very niche, and you're going to have a highly differentiated, authentic SUV strategy, you actually can't get volume. Last four quarters, continuously, we've been number two by volume, over and above being number one by revenue market share. So even, even with our currently focused, differentiated, authentic SUV strategy, we are able to sell volumes and be at number two level in a market which, like you said, there are 40 brands. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, pricing power will be around how much differentiation you try to bring in. Mm -hmm. And if you have a differentiated portfolio, uh, customers will want to buy you. Our average XUE 700 price right now is more than 25 lakhs. Uh, we hadn't thought two years back that a Mahindra would sell at an average mm -hmm. price of 25 to 30 lakhs. You've taken the 50 to 20, 20 to 25. That's correct. 25% is the net premium advantage, brand advantage you're getting now. That's correct. So, if you have a differentiated offering which is well packed, customers are going to be willing to pay for it. But that, like we've always said, that doesn't mean we go indiscreetly or uh, recklessly and increase prices and you know lose the value proposition. It's about getting that sweet spot right. But you don't expect any kind of an SUV war. I mean, the incumbents can they come back? Can the Koreans come back? Can the Europeans come back? And what could be called as a price war? Maruti has triggered a lot of price wars in the past in the sedan market. Yeah. And now they are coming up with new launches because they have less than 20% market share in SUV. You are hitting them where it hurts them the most, the sedan market. So can there be a price war in the SUV market? You know, uh, once uh, once any segment is 50-60% of the overall category which the SUV mm -hmm. is right now, you would expect a high level of competitive intensity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would. Like you said, there are 40 brands. Mm -hmm. Why would not every player want to come in and yeah. be part of mm -hmm. that game? Uh, so certainly we would expect high level of competitive intensity and which is all the more reason our strategy is going to be about driving high level of differentiation, have a very differentiated portfolio and do products which we believe go well with our brand DNA and which also appeal to the Indian consumer. So it's not like, okay, it's working in some other part of the world, so let's do that here because that's the platform we have or that's the product offering we have around the world. What's the game plan when it comes to overall EVs in terms of the overall CapEx as well that has been lined up till FY27 as well? There were some ambitious plans here. Yeah, so uh, clearly we're preparing for an EV game, Avansh, and we've said that between 20 to 30 percent of our SUVs, we just spoke about the competitive uh, strategy yeah. in the SUV game, would come from electric vehicles in 2027. Uh, and again, there we have a very differentiated EV offering strategy. We're not playing to the let's sell to those who want the greatest level of economic advantage. Of course, that would be a reason to buy, 
but to get that level of economic advantage you need to be driving 150 kilometers a day uh, not many people are going to do that uh, we believe that there are many other reasons why people will buy our ev offering one is the design style the standout look uh, the human machine interface uh, which is you know all, it's going to be a very software driven vehicle so uh, that's going to be the basis of competitive advantage and differentiation uh, as you know we've also done a second round of fundraise with tamasek yeah. and uh, which is valued that uh, ev business is 15% higher valuation than what we had yeah. with bii at 9.8 billion dollars yeah. all questions and rbl we'll go to anish or <laughs> can i throw one or two at you as well uh, i will i will maybe quote and quote anish as a reply so go on no my only point is that i have had the pleasure of tracking mahindra and mahindra for years now and last 3 4 years the capital allocation change has been fantastic an absolute reboot in terms of capital allocation policy for a group of your size a small investment how will this move the needle whether it's core non core i don't know but how will this move the needle because the amount of scrutiny you've come under because of the small investment of 450 500 crore was it worth it yeah nikunj let's just try and recap and i'm going to kind of play out some of the things that anish has said on this over a mm. lot over friday because you yeah, know this yeah. was a key topic of conversation of across across the meets on friday we've said we are not going beyond 3.5% yeah. there's no plan to do that right so firstly any any speculation that may that may be there on what's the extent of deviation we may be mm. doing from a capital allocation policy doesn't cross the 400 yeah. crores yeah. kind of thing uh the second is what anish has said i think is mm. that it gives us an option in case opportunities grow come up in the future mm. 400 crores is not a high amount of money to put mm. in a business in a sector in which we already have a market cap of 40000 crores yes. plus yes right so if you are putting 400 crores in today you have an option of seeing where does that go over yeah. the next 5 7 10 yeah. years or you have an option of saying it's not going anywhere we can get out and we are very unlikely to lose money because we bought in at a very mm-hmm. uh, attractive price so i i think anish has been able to convince mm-hmm. a lot of the analyst and you're already seeing the impact of that it, on so the stock market today if things don't work the way you're thinking it may just end up becoming a treasury operation that's correct i mean so and uh, on a treasury operation you're likely to make money and uh, in any case there could be an opportunity as uh, anish has been saying to help us learn the sector a little better uh in whatever way that conversation could go the same investment could have been done through mahindra and mahindra finance also their balance sheet can easily absorb 400 crores yeah. and they could have also made the same treasury gain for them it would have been more strategic fit and all the questions we are asking you today if this investment would have been done in mahindra and mahindra finance those questions would have not been asked yeah. how about that uh yeah nikunj and again this question has been answered so i'm going to recap uh, it's for us as a shareholder to learn the business and give the option of mm. uh, as a shareholder to decide what's the implication on mahindra finance if banking was to open up 5 years or 7 mm. years later uh, for non banking financial institutions and in that scenario should mahindra finance move into becoming a bank or not is a shareholder decision right and we felt since this is a shareholder decision not impacting immediate outcomes of a financial services sector uh we as a shareholder should make that investment. just one one follow up question and that's not about this deal but in general about the importance of nbfc business you need the nbfc business to sell cars the second hand business is doing very well is this also some kind of an indication that you're getting ready for the turf which is that nbfcs up until now were given a lot of free hand by rbi but stringent stringent norms are coming maybe this is mahindra and mahindra's attempt to diversify their risk away from nbfc because you see the landscape changing in 3 4 5 years you preparing it early yeah i i would just maybe paraphrase nikun to say we are preparing ourselves for future scenarios by exactly. way of uh, that's a fair know, assessment and to say that we should you know we, we can we spend 400 crores out of you know cash uh, streams that we have including not taking mm-hmm. money away from auto farm to pay for this yeah, and yeah, take paying it out of the services i i think it's you know the way we think about it is a good thing to do to prepare ourselves for the future and we have all the options to play that out are we done with rbl <laughs> no <laughs> yeah, yeah no you started with one question <laughs> it just the answers were so interesting that i was intrigued the answers were so important that i was drawn into but thank you for patiently 
uh, yeah. you know agreeing to answer one but actually answering three questions <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm not going to ask her that so no need to worry but it's been a uh, tractor volumes that have been surprising very well there have been a lot of new launches there's an increased distribution network as well so in light of all of this is this trajectory going to continue for tractor volume growth? Yeah so I'm going to answer in two parts one is the tractor industry hmm. right tractor industry comes off a very high base of F23 uh, we think that will be low single digit growth uh, many positive enabling factors in the rural market. Uh, the rains coming in in July, even though a little delayed, has not affected sowing. So Kharif sowing is good. The rabi crop last time was good. Uh, we expect government spending in rural to go up as we move into multiple election state and then uh, national over a period of time. So several enabling factors. But right now we are not changing from low single digit for the industry because uh, we would rather, rather wait and watch and we know that the tractor industry is on high base. We've been gaining market share. Uh, we gained again uh, by TD July uh, about 0.5 percent on top of a very good growth last year. We see further upside because there's a segment of the market, the orchard and the lightweight tractors where we have a lower presence than our national market share. Uh, we have just launched Swaraj Target, a new product there and we're going to launch the Mahindra Oja. Uh, on 15th August. So we have two big launches happening in a segment in which our market share is 30 percent compared to the national, our national average of 42 percent. We look at, uh, you know, uh, the car industry sales, the passenger car business growing at 4 percent, aggregate picture. But we look at the SUV market growing at a different rate. How much of this growth is also a factor of this demand squeeze or product availability squeeze which happened in 2021 and 22? So right now, are the numbers looking strong because you're adding more production and this is pure booking which is you're delivering? For Mahindra? For Mahindra. Uh, see, right now, our, uh, even though we have a wait period uh, and we, that's why we started putting out new bookings mm -hmm. on top of what's the open bookings. Mm. Uh, the new bookings for most of our products are still higher than our enhanced manufacturing capacity. New bookings are still higher than enhanced manufacturing, manufacturing capacity, okay. right? So, okay. so I think that's that's mm. the key thing to mm. track. Mm. So right now we're producing at 36, mm. 37,000 is what we did in July, which is very close to our current capacity. As you know, mm. capacity will go up to 49,000 by the end of the financial year. Our new bookings are 45,000 plus, right? So the new bookings are higher than the rate of production. And hence, the waiting periods are still not coming down as much as we want to, mm -hmm. because unless uh, you know we are able to produce to beat new bookings and cover earlier bookings, you're not going to bring down waiting period dramatically. So that's the endeavor as we get to the next phase of capacity increase. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the demand for the premium models like the Scorpio, the XCV 700, that continues to remain strong. Are you seeing sluggishness in any category like the Bolero, XCV 300? Yeah, the, uh, like I said a little earlier, the segments which are less yeah. than 10 lakh price points that have been slow for the last 12 mm -hmm. months and both Bolero and 3 are in mm -hmm. that segment and of course that's there's even greater competitive intensity. So where does that leave your overall EBIT margins at looking at these metrics? So, uh, you know, we did very good uh, auto PBIT margins uh, as we call them. Uh, we were last year quarter one at 5.3 and this year we've gone to 7.5. 7.5 is close to our F19 level. Now, when we look at margin as a percentage, as we often have said, when you are in an inflationary situation as we are, we have seen commodity increases of even now adjusted level 15, 17 mm percent -hmm. after the correction has happened, plus BS6 that happened in after, uh, you know the March of 2020 and then BS6.2 now. So there is commodity and then there is product change for regulation. Uh, we're still able to maintain a percentage margin of what we had in 2019. So we, I think we've done very well through managing model mix and uh, pricing and cost overall cost to be able to get there. I mean, until August is perhaps one of the biggest month for SUV launches. That's what industry tells us in terms of what the industry would be launching. Historically, we've seen that the attention and the market show always gravitates towards new launches. For example, you rule the market in 21 and 22 because of new, new launches. How will you counter with the new launches which now are A, coming with an edge, B, they are coming with the fact that the peers and the industry knows that, look, this is the product available in the market, we need to do it better in terms of modification or in terms of the pricing? Yeah, you know, uh, Nikunj, you're right that uh, new, new products always tend to get an initially high traction and we've seen the benefit of that as well. 
we've had our share of that too and you know maybe one may want to call it a variant but we launched thar for uh, two yes. wheel drive in january yeah. we were able to launch that at a sub 10 mm-hmm. lakh price and uh, that's what helped get thar mm-hmm. into momentum yes. right so yes. new product doesn't always have to be something completely new mm-hmm. if you're able to create a proposition mm-hmm. and a like variant. scorpio you did yeah scorpio mm-hmm. n is now just a little mm-hmm. over a mm-hmm. year old so it's not mm-hmm. certainly mm-hmm. not in the old category I don't think we have fully leveraged the opportunity mm-hmm. of that. The interesting thing in our portfolio mm-hmm. is we have Bolero, which is 23 years old yeah. and uh, still wow. remains 9,000 mm-hmm. plus. It was launched mm-hmm. in 2000. Mm-hmm. The original Scorpio was launched in 2002. Mm-hmm. And Scorpio Classic demand actually went mm-hmm. up uh, with the refresh that we did and after mm-hmm. we launched Scorpio 9, so uh, Scorpio N. Mm-hmm. So in our, in our kind of products, because of you know the kind of customers we have, Mm-hmm. We actually don't see our products going to decline like a lot of the others because the differentiation is so high that uh, customers are buying us even more with time mm-hmm. uh, than they would, you know, out of the new, okay, here's something new and let me just go and do a one quick mm-hmm. flirtatious swing there. Mm-hmm. So just to bring it for our viewers, if I look at the platforms you have, Scorpio is a platform, XUV500, XUV is a platform, yeah. Bolero is a platform, Thar is a platform. You are in no hurry to launch any new platform per se and your existing platforms you think will have at least three to five years of shelf life. They may have, you know, variations here, engine size, chassis size, yeah. those are variants, right? Yeah. Thar will become four door is what I've been told. Those are all platforms. Those are all incremental changes. That's correct. But your platforms you think are built to last for the next three to five years? Uh, we think our platforms are built to last for longer uh, because... Unlike the past, this time we've done very good work over the last five years in creating very future-ready platforms which are very lightweight, very good uh, powertrain solutions, both gasoline and diesel. So at least five to seven years plus, we don't think we need to do anything on platforms. We're going to be basically creating products on these platforms in the ice world. We're creating new platforms on the EV space as you know, we're going to do the in-glow platform. I mean, told you what hard stop now, but you got 30 seconds and Avan does not drive ICB. <laughs> really? Here's someone, she never drives the SUV. So maybe a 30 second sales pitch. Sales pitch? <laughs> no, so, you know, if I, if I have to sell you one product in our portfolio, it would be Thar. And I, I need a test drive. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. done. <laughs> okay, thank you so much Thanks. for stopping by and being with us and really clarifying a lot when it comes to your tractor volume, your business, the RBL stake, etc. That's the management of M&M speaking to ET. Now, where's the stock at? Well, 2.7% higher. 15.05 is where M&M is currently at. 